welcome to uh, the final lecture in this year's Faculty After Hours Centennial Lecture Series. I'm told that if I don't do a good job introducing Mary Lynn, this little guy here is going to bite me. So I'll have to be really careful. Uh, as many of you know, we are celebrating our 100th anniversary as a college here at St. Joseph's. And uh, this faculty lecture series is part of that centennial celebration. The theme of the centennial is realize the promise. And all of the faculty who have spoken in this uh, lecture series have addressed in different ways this theme of realizing the promise, as the college has done for 100 years. I want to uh, encourage you to pay close attention this fall to the second installment of the faculty lecture series. We'll have a new slate of faculty lecturing on a range of interesting topics. I also want to extend a very special invitation to all of you to come to a lecture next week, uh, Wednesday evening. Father Edward Malloy, a former president of the University of Notre Dame, will be speaking next Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. in our gymnasium on the topic, Stories of Heroes and Heroines as the Source of Our Hope and the Grounds of Our Promise. Father Malloy is certainly one of the best known and most prestigious figures in Catholic higher education. So I hope that all of you will, will be able to join us Wednesday evening, admission is open to the public and absolutely free, and with a reception following. Uh, I'd like to also take a moment to introduce the members of the Academic Planning Committee for the Centennial, who have put together uh, this faculty lecture series, the appearance by Father Malloy, and some other activities as well. Uh, I'm one member of that uh, committee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Edward Riley, and I'd like to introduce uh, other members. Our speaker tonight, whom I will introduce in much more detail in just a moment, is, of course, one of our committee members. Also, we have Sister uh, Patricia Flynn. Is sister here? No. Uh, Twyla Weisbrod, who is here somewhere. Twyla is back up there. Uh, Shelly Davis, who is the director of our library, Thomas Hancock, uh, June Irvine. June is somewhere here, too, back up there. Uh, Sister Michelle Aronica. Also uh, want to invite you after the talk tonight to stay around for a little bit and uh, attend our reception. For those of you who aren't familiar with the building, the reception is on the second floor. So if you exit from the top door, You'll uh, find it. I also want to thank the sponsor of our lecture tonight, Bon Appetit, our wonderful food service that helps all of us put on weight. And now to, uh, to turn to the main event. The speaker tonight is Mary Lynn Engel, an assistant professor of business at St. Joseph's College. The topic of her talk is discover your personal brand and how to communicate it. Professor Engel earned her undergraduate degree in political science at Miami University in Ohio, later earning a Master of Science in Marketing Communications from Roosevelt University in Chicago. Professor Engel began her professional career in sales at a television station. She then moved into advertising in the Chicago area advancing from small, local advertising agencies to large, international firms. As advertising manager for Ameritech Corporation, which you know today as AT&T, a Fortune 50 company in Chicago, Professor Engel produced national and international award-winning advertising for the Ameritech Complete MasterCard. At Ameritech, she was instrumental in their branding makeover. She later served as a marketing and corporate communications consultant in Ohio and here in Maine. After moving to Maine, Professor Engel also was Director of Communications and Administration at USA Telephone, 
and Director of Communications at Martins Point Healthcare. She then turned to teaching and became a full-time member of the St. Joseph's College Business Department in 2008. Professor Engel has long been engaged in branding at Ameritech at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and for a variety of individual organizations. She has brought her expertise in branding to St. Joseph's College where she serves on our branding committee and teaches the only undergraduate course in branding in Northern New England. Tonight, Professor Engel will help all of us to understand the importance of developing our own personal brands. Please welcome Professor Mary Lynn Engel. Well, I have to say, if you're not impressed, I am. I, mean, um, I, I hope that this is not, a, uh, you don't take this as a real formal lecture. I hope that you take it as something that it, you can learn from and take something away with it. We tend to get a little upset with the word brand. It, branding has a lot of, uh, it's kind of the new words of the day and it's get, it gets used a lot. So um, this is my impression of what branding is. I give you my word. Sometimes you'll hear that branding is a promise. Uh, it is a promise, but um, the idea is that I give you my word, I, I'm going to stand behind it, and that's what's really important. So why personal branding? The fact is you all are branded, well, um, not you know the hot iron, but uh, you all have a personal brand right now, and it's whether or not you choose to uh, manage it or let somebody else manage it for you. So um, a lot of different um, logos, and my question to you would be, are these brands? And probably most of you are going to say, sure. Um, it's McDonald's, it's Amazon, NBC, whatever. And I would tell you that these are really uh, props for brands. A brand would be, uh, other props would be the name of whatever it is, um, taglines, colors. All of these are props so when you make that promise, someone is going to uh, have a reason to think about you and remember who you are. So what is a brand? You make a promise. You're making a promise to somebody or you're an organization making a promise. And then there's some sort of experience. It could be a, a real experience, like you walk into McDonald's. It could be something more virtual. It all depends what it is and what the promise is. And then you're going to come up with what's in it for me. So somebody, I can make you a promise, and I can say this is going to be the best lecture you've ever heard in your entire life. You're going to experience the lecture, and then you decide if it was the best lecture or not. If you think it was a great lecture, then, you're gonna, then my promise was a good one. If you said, boy, did I waste an hour, but I hope the cookies are great, then uh, the, the brand's not going to be such a great brand. But this is really the process that you go through for branding. You make a promise, you have an experience, and then it's the person on the other end. It's the, um, the customer, so to speak, if it's personal branding, who really gets to decide whether or not you, the brand that you think you have is the real one. So uh, look at this because you're going to see this a lot, and I'm going to test you on it. A brand is an emotional connection. Um, all the, you know, the pretty logo, the names, everything, again, those are all props. But unless you make the emotional connection, you don't have anything. You have a promise that is just kind of open out into the air. You can, if you were a marketer, you could be sending messages through advertising, television, whatever, but if it doesn't relate to somebody, if somebody doesn't get it, that they, uh, you're helping them with a need, useless. So um, David Ogilvy actually came up with this um, saying. David Ogilvy was one of the... Um, great beginners of uh, standard advertising. Uh, Ogilvy and Mather was his agency, 
And what he said was, a product was made in the factory and a brand is made in the mind. And I put in the customer's head. The, um, so think about, you have Tide, you have Cheer. They're both P&G products. They both um, will clean, I, I don't know if they clean any differently or not, but I know that I grew up in a household that only used Tide. Therefore, I have some sort of an co emotional connection to Tide. I have no idea why, but it's there. And um, what we use in our house, we use Tide. So the idea is you're making that promise. Remember you had that promise, but um, the product is not the brand. The product is a way of distributing the brand. If I'm, um, I, I'm a little nervous about saying this because John Zarillo's here, but uh, brand equity. You, if Coca-Cola has, um, you know, sometimes it's like seventy billion dollars worth of their is their stock is worth that kind of money, but their net assets are worth just a small amount of that. So the the air between what their stock price is and what their net worth is, is basically the brand. Did I get it right? Thank you. Okay. It's kind of nervous to say that. Okay, so uh, what is a personal brand? And uh, this is a quote from Peter Montoya. And a personal brand is basically a positive idea. Obviously, you want it to be positive. You don't want it to be negative. Um, that you want other people to think, uh, that comes to other people's mind when they think of you. So, you know, whether you want people to think of you as real bright or a, an artist, whatever it is, that's what uh, you need to strive for for your brand. So it, it's, it's what you stand for, what your values are, and um, you want to turn that, if you're into a business situation, you want to turn that into an opportunity. Um, and I guess I shouldn't say it's just a business situation. If you're trying to make connections with somebody, you're trying to network, you're trying to just grow your, um, your friend, the base of friends, um, that's also something where you're trying to build this opportunity. Um, I, don't have the quote, I don't have the article up here because it's really kind of a long article. But Tom Peters, in 1997, wrote an article called, a, um, it's called A Brand Called You. And he actually started the idea of personal branding. And you can just Google A Brand Called You and it'll come up, uh, there's a PDF and it'll come up. And it, it's really, it was, like I said, it was written in 97, it could have been written yesterday. It's absolutely a terrific piece. So how do we build this brand? And there's some components that we're going to go through. Uh, it needs to be distinctive, it needs to be relevant, and it needs to be consistent. So distinctive. Um, it, you need to come up with something that only you can say. I mean, your name is something only you can say. Unless it's Bob Smith, then you know, maybe there's a lot of Bob Smiths. But the idea is you need to say, what is it that you really stand for? What, what's really uh, you strongly believe? And say that uh, for you to say, I'm the best, mm, that's not really distinctive. A lot of people will think that they're the best. Or a lot of people think, well, I've got a great personality. Sure, you have a great personality, but so do a lot of other people. So we need to get a little past that. Uh, we need to make sure that it's relevant. And it's not relevant to you, it's relevant to the person that you're talking to. We kind of forget that um, the brand, in the old days, marketers felt that they could just put an, an ad on television or whatever, and you know they would just tell people, this is what our brand is, and you've got to believe it. And in the early days of television, because it was so new, people did. That doesn't really happen uh, anymore. So you, you need to understand that when somebody is thinking of relevancy, they're thinking of what's in it for me. Because think about, I don't care if you're doing the most altruistic thing in the world, um, you're really answering something saying, what's in it for me? And it's, you know, maybe it's that it makes you feel good. 
Um, it doesn't matter what, it, you're, you're not going, most likely you're not going to do it unless there, it answers in some way or f uh, fashion what's in it for me. And for people who know me, um, I just talk this blue in the face, you have to be consistent about it. The worst thing that in establishing a brand is being inconsistent because it causes confusion. And confusion is the antithesis of a brand. You need to be clear, you need to be concise, and you need to be consistent. And one of the things in consistency is not just the words that you use, but your dress, your, um, your demeanor, um, maybe some colors that you use depending upon what it is that, um, how personal or how professional this is. So, what's a brand? Thank you very much. Okay. One of the things in marketing, if you don't get, if you don't know, is that it takes three, it usually takes three times before people get it, get something. So be aware, you're going to have to answer the question a few more times. Okay. So um, I'm going to go through this slide, and in the meantime, you're going to get a pass out that it, for something that we're going to work through. Um, in the, re uh, the rest of the presentation, okay, so uh, while we're doing it. But one of the important things is, you know, you are putting your values in your brand, and you don't need a piece of paper, uh, you don't need a pencil, you don't have to do it. Uh, you, you might want to take this home or something. But anyway, um, you need to understand that you're kind of putting yourself on the line when you decide what your brand is. And there are going to be times when you're going to have to say, um, can I actually stand behind what I say? Can I actually live up to what it is? And marketers and business people have to do this all the time. They're doing it when they have a recall. Um, they're doing it when um, something doesn't go quite right and there gets to be some sort of a tarnish on their brand. How are they going to bring it back? And on a personal level, you've got to do it too. So, and we all have our little pieces of paper. And the reason you didn't get this ahead of time is because if you're like any student, you would be looking at that instead of looking at me. So, uh, so the first exercise, if you look on it, is um, there's there's two sides of the paper. We're not going to spend a lot. We're not going to be extra paper here. So, uh, who are you? And you're going to answer some questions. And the first question is, what are your personal values? So um, what, what you're going to do here is you're going to list three brands. Don't give it a whole, whole lot of thought. Uh, just at top of mind, what are three brands that you really like? And if you're going to write it down now, fine. If not, just kind of move along with me, OK? So first you write down the three brands, and then you say, why do you like them? What is it about those brands that you like? Um, I like McDonald's, and one of the reasons I like McDonald's is because I like the fries. Not that they're so good for me, I don't care. I like the fries. So um, I like Coke because it has some meaning to me. I, I don't know, I'm a Coke person. So whatever it is, why do you like them? And then after you look at that, you should be able to see that there's some common themes. It might be quality. It might be excitement. I don't know what it is that you wrote down, so there's no way for me to know, and I'm not going to ask you. But you need to look through it and say, what are some of the common themes? And those common themes are going to help tell you what your values are. Okay. And then the next part is your vision. And we, visions are very, very lofty usually. And it's here, what, what's the one thing that you would really like to do in life? What's the one thing that you would really want to see transformed or improved? And if it's to you know, end her, uh, human hunger, that's fine. If it's to get a baseball park, that's fine. 
whatever it is that's really, that's something that you would really like to see accomplished down the road. So you write that down. You got a little space for that. Okay, um, the next thing makes people a little uncomfortable sometimes, but it really doesn't have to be, but imagine yourself at your own funeral. What are people saying about you? Are they saying, wow, this person really did a lot, a great friend? Are they saying that it was a real shame of, that she didn't go any further? I, I don't know, what is it that you think will have touched people's lives. Um, and so, like I said, when I do this with students, students say, I don't expect to be dead in a long time. I don't either, but the idea is kind of see what, what do you think other people are going to say and how you touch their lives. And then passion. What would, what would get you up on a Sunday morning at 6 o'clock? Voluntarily, that's the important word, voluntarily. Uh, if most of you would probably say, I don't want to get up at six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. So that's why I asked the question, what would get you up at six o'clock on Sunday morning, voluntarily? And most likely that is going to be a part of what your passion is all about. Um, are you passionate about sports? Are you passionate about going out, um, walking? I, I, I don't know what it is. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it matters to you. It's just that it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. So if you came up with a whole good list of these things, circle the top, you're going to circle the top five. Um, maybe you came up with 20 things. I, I can't think of 20 things that would get me up voluntarily, but it maybe it would for you, but so you have to figure out what are the top ones that would get you up. And then what are some of the characteristics that you think are attributes that you have? And you know, it could be that you're, you're likable, you're honest, um, you're caring, um, you have a good sense of humor, you can spell, I, I don't know, whatever the attributes are, and then circle the top ones. Again, um, a lot of us, it, especially if you take this home and start thinking about it, you might come up with a fairly long list, and the point is we want what's going to kind of come up to the top, okay? And one of the last things you're thinking about, who are you reaching? So this go, the first questions were all about you. The, the, now we're saying we can make that promise about, you know, I, I know my values, I know my passion, I know some of my attributes, et cetera, but who am I talking to? Who's going to care that these are relevant? And so are you talking to... Um, prospective employers? Are you talking to your peers? Are you talking to parents? Um, again, it's going to depend upon what position you're in. And I, I guess as a sidebar to this, I would say the process that we're going through right now is the process that a business goes through. Maybe they go it a little bit more in depth, but it's basically the same thing that a business would go through, a Fortune 50 business goes through, but uh, as I said, it's a little bit more in depth, and they do it by committee, which is really pretty horrible. So, but you need to figure out who it, who it is that you're trying to reach, and then you write your story. Um, decide, it, you know, put into a paragraph just who you are, and think about it. How how does this relate to you? How do you feel about it? So you're not writing a tagline. You're writing a story about yourself. And that story is going to help you identify who you think you are, who you want to be, that, who you want to be, and how are you going to get there to be that. Okay, so um, think about what your story is. I'm sorry, I keep looking down. I'm not used to this little thing. So, again, thank you very much. Are you getting, I mean, I hope that you're kind of getting the idea that it is 
Um, it is about the connection between the two of you, um, whoever those two are, even Amazon. If you're working with Amazon and Amazon uh, is trying to sell something to you, they're trying to build an emotional connection with you. They will come back and say, you didn't buy this certain thing. Maybe this is something you would like to buy. They, they'll send you questionnaires to ask you, how was, how was, your, how was the service? And you're not dealing with an individual person, but they're trying to get you to feel comfortable with who they are and what they do. So even something as virtual as that. Okay, now we've got a second exercise. And I don't know that we really, this, is, this should really take um, a little more thought and a little more time. The first one is a, a little bit more on the fun part, but um, not that it isn't serious, but it's a little more on the fun part. But if you, um, if you are networking or in kind of a business situation, the elevator speech is really something that's very important. So what I thought we would do is I'm going to just go through what the different points of an elevator speech are, but you fill it out on, on your, time, your own time. And one of the things that's important about both parts of these is you should test it. You should ask friends that you really trust and say, is this how you see me? And am I believable? Because if, if, you're, if it's not believable to your friends, it's certainly not gonna be believable to strangers. So uh, we're gonna go through some of your homework. Okay, so first of all, what's an elevator speech? We don't have a whole lot of elevators in Maine because we don't have a whole lot of tall buildings. But when I come from Chicago, you know, we got skyscrapers. So you think of the elevator speech as the time it would take you uh, except in this building because it's so long. But the time in the elevator, you, you would take you from, one, uh, from the top floor to the bottom floor. So you're thinking about 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Basically, it's one or two sentences. And if you can't grab your audience in one or two sentences, they're out of the elevator. They're talking to somebody else. Even if you're at a networking party, um, if you, they're, on, they're moved on. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through some of the process of creating an elevator speech and hearing what, or reading one, what it really can do. So some of, if anybody's in sales, they know what a USP is, unique selling proposition. But I'm going to say it a little bit differently. So the U is ultimate advantage. What is it that, again, it goes back to some of the other, what is it that you can give me, the customer, that nobody else can give me? It, 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 you have to keep thinking about as the, for the customer, not for yourself. Very tough in the old marketing for, uh, four Ps, they have to be thrown out. Um, the second is the S, you have to make a great offer. What can you do for me that nobody else can do? Um, I can be your friend. Oh, you know, that's nice. A lot of people will say that. So what is it that's really... And last but not least, you need to make a powerful process. Uh, process. You need to make a powerful promise. Um, it, that promise, you know, that's what we think of the brand, but the promise is really something that is going to be the catch, kind of the catch. So now I understand what your advantage is, I know what you, you know, you've got this offer, but unless it's really a promise to me, unless it's something personal to me, I don't know what good it's gonna do. So it all goes down to the benefit to me. And it sounds very uh, self-centered, because I keep talking about for me, and absolutely, it's absolutely self-centered. It has nothing about the marketer. The marketer has to forget that they're important. In 1950s, 60s, 70s, the marketers were supreme. These days, it's the customer that's supreme. Um, there is, there's so much more information out there that was never there before. There's the internet. So the customers really are the ones that are gonna determine whether or not your brand works or not. 
If you think about Exxon or you think about BP, they had terrific brands until something happened. There was a, a crisis and BP stock did, just went to pieces for a short period of time. Uh, the fact of the matter is, other than the one or two oil wells, whatever uh, was out there, they really didn't lose any of their other net assets. They, that was a small, small portion of who they were, but their stock um, tumbled because people didn't believe them anymore. They didn't believe the actions that they were taking to fix it up. So what do you see on television now? You see ads telling people how good of a job they're doing, and now it's up to you to decide whether or not those job, that is real. So here's some examples of what elevator speeches are not. And um, my name is Stephen, and I'm in PR. Well, a lot of people's name Stephen, a lot of people in PR. My name is, I sell life insurance, and I'm a financial planner. Again, could be a lot of people. You could change the name, and it's still a lot of people. My name is Mary Lynn, and I teach. Now, I granted there aren't a lot of teachers named Mary Lynn, but there must be some others. Um, but the idea is there's a lot of teachers out there. You don't know what I teach. You don't know it, that I'm any good at it, that you'll never know from this. But the, th the idea is what's the benefit to the listener? There's no benefit here. And if you were writing your elevator speech and that's where you came to, you'd fail the project. Okay, so um, how do I get the, oh, I, I, I see something different than you do. Okay, so say, you know, there's Stefan, and he's in PR, and he adds that he's been in business for 20 years, and he, we're the best. Everybody's the best. Have you ever been to a pizza place that didn't win awards? Everybody win awards, you know, right? I mean, their mother gave him an award. It's great. You can say that you have an award. So um, that still isn't going to differentiate them. Um, now we've got the, the Phonia, who is the financial planner, and we have high quality standards. Who's going to tell you that you don't have high quality? Am I going to tell you I have lousy standards? I mean, it's not going to happen. So again, not going to work. And then I put that, okay, I'm Mary Lynn, I teach, I'm in the business department of St. Joseph's College. Again, so what? There are six other, full, there are five other full-time professors in the business department, and there's a whole bunch of adjuncts. Again, what, what's in it for me? And, you know, if you were yawning, which I, I can understand, but I can't, I'm not going to look at you, um, you'd be thinking, so what? So I, I still don't get how this is something that is going to grab somebody in an elevator to a and get them to um, continue talking. So here's some examples. I'm Stephen. I help a small business improve the way they market and promote their products and services. That's the PR part. I find cl uh, clients. I close deals. I enhance, uh, I enhance customer retention. Boy, that's a whole lot more than public relations. That's a whole lot. Now I say, wow, if I'm looking for somebody who is going to help me get customer retention, this is a somebody that I want to talk to. And I, I, I'll, I'll, let's step out of the elevator and, and let's talk about this if I'm in, 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 um, in the market for something like that. And then we have the financial planner, and she helps families save money so they can pay off their mortgage sooner. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, buy the best education for their children, relax and enjoy retirement. A financial planner that understands my needs. So maybe if, I, if this financial planner was talking to me and I didn't care about my mortgage and I didn't care about um, my kid's education, maybe this wouldn't ring real true with me. But if I do care about those things, I certainly found out what the benefit of this woman is to me. And, I'm a, and I have the opportunity to continue. Now, you can decide whether I did this right. But my name is Mary Lynn. I'm a professor at St. Joseph's College with a passion for branding. 
Uh, I use my experience of branding a Fortune 50 company to help brand individuals and organizations of all types and sizes. I have to tell you, it's really hard to do it for yourself. So, um, you know, you can decide what. But the, uh, hopefully the idea here is that I've taken it past teaching. I'm not Chris Bond. I don't teach uh, accounting. I don't teach international studies. I teach branding. I teach marketing. I teach communications. And if somebody's interested in that, I can help them depending. And it doesn't matter if they're an individual, a, business, a small business, or a Fortune 50 company. So basically, that's uh, the idea of um, an elevator speech. So I would like you to take this um, home with you and think about how you can fill it in for yourself and then um, check it out. So double check. Ask yourselves, um, what problem did I really solve? This goes back to the first part of it. What problem did I uh, really solve? Is it distinctive? Is it relevant? And is it consistent? Distinctive, relevant, and consistent. Because we get caught up in a lot of those attributes that we really want people to know about, that how great we are, how kind we are, et cetera. But uh, very few people are going to say otherwise. Um, so that's really important. So one more time. Much better, much better. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and um, I'll see if I can answer them. Yes, John. Welcome. Everything that you say or do, everything how you act. If you were a business, I would say your logo has to do something to represent. But we don't all have logos in our own business cards and whatever. But how we dress, how we interact with people, if um, even how we answer the telephone. Yeah, OK, that's not too exciting. But if you, hi, this is Mary Lynn, how can I help you, or whatever. I, what, what, is your, um, what does your voicemail say about you? How, what, you know, is it funny? Is it um, informative? Is it rude? I mean, there are a lot, a lot of times that it just says, you know what to do, and answer it and hang up. Well, that's making your brand. I mean, that, that really is. So, and if you're going out into the professional world, how you dress, I mean, everybody knows I dress in black, so um, that's, I guess that's part of my brand. Um, so if you were a business, I would say there's certain colors that represent different businesses better than other. Red is a very energizing color. So for a person, for, as an individual, it's not so much just what's your favorite color, but uh, if you're doing something for materials or whatever, I would say pick colors that represent um, what, is, what it is that you want to represent. And anytime you talk, it has to be that speech. It has to be that elevator speech of some sort. Yes. Um, I would say something like Oakhurst. I think Oakhurst has a great brand and what, I mean, milk is milk for most people, but they've been able to differentiate themselves because of their probiotics, the idea that they're um, all natural and they've, so they've been able to come out with something that's distinctive there's a benefit to it because it's pro, uh, p they're telling people that probiotics or whatever it is that they have um, is good for you, and they're absolutely consistent in their message. So that's one. Um, 
another one. Do you need another one? Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think it's two things. One, we didn't call it branding in the old days. We called it, I give you my word. So if I, on a personal basis, if I, or we're doing uh, business on a handshake, you're giving a promise over that it could be m worth millions of dollars. You're, you're saying on a handshake, well, today we're not uh, quite as nice, we're not quite as civil as that. So... We have a lot more legal constraints about doing some. So giving my word doesn't always go as far as it did. And now it, we're getting into the term branding. And I almost wish we didn't use the word because companies, when they are looking into branding, they think of branding as something in the marketing department. And they think of it as something, well, marketing's going to take care of it, and I don't have to worry about it. And that's absolutely not true. Branding has to be absolutely, completely throughout the whole organization. Every speech, every brochure, every color, every business card, every email, any kind of communications whatsoever, internally and externally, has to have the same message. And that's where the branding comes. And internally, I mean, this whole um, talk is supposed to be about personal branding, but... Um, if you're with a company, internal branding is going to be more important than external because if your, com if your employees don't feel it, they don't walk the talk, the, your customers will never believe what you have to say. Jonathan? Well, it's, it's interesting. I worked for McDonald's for um, a few years, so thank you. Um, their brand is actually food, folks, and fun. That's their mantra. So when you think about it, if you're going to a McDonald's, you're not going for quality food. Uh, even if you go for their salads, the dressing on the salad, it, the calories in that is humongous. So um, you're not going there. You're going for food, for fast food. You're going for camaraderie. Uh, I know we live in Yarmouth, and if you go to a McDonald's in the morning, there's the, you know, there's the coffee clutch there that takes up the, the whole place. So there, and if you, it, before there were um, a lot of coffee shops like Starbucks around, if you were meeting somebody for a business, deal. Where'd you go? You went to McDonald's. So it was a comfortable place to go. And the fun part is for the kids. The happy meals, the, um, you know, kids before they can say anything else, they can say Donald's. Um, they know chicken, they know chicken nuggets. And um, so you put it all together and, you know, they, they're always trying new things and they're trying, they do try to modernize but that, they're not trying to really be in uh, competition. They're obviously in some competition, but they don't have the same kind of products as a Subway would have. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sister. That's exactly why it's there. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me to say that. Um, I found this um, PowerPoint background, and to me, it's exactly what branding is about, to make sure that you stand out. And I happen to have a red car, but um, you know, th that's not why I picked it. But yeah, that's exact. you want to stand out from the crowd. 
And it's not that you have to be a leader. It's not that you have to do anything terribly special, but we're all individuals, and we'd like to be thought of as individuals. And that's where the branding comes in. Yes? Well, I, I, it's interesting. When I one of um, one of the classes that I had in, for organizational behavior, I asked the students what motivates them, and they we we went through a whole exercise. And what finally came down to what motivates them is how the professor feels in front of the class. You know, if I'm in a good mood, they're in a good mood. If I'm in a bad mood. They're, they're not interested, they're in a bad mood. So how we, and I'm not saying that, you know, sometimes we, get, we go out of, out of our offices and we say showtime because we don't necessarily want to go down and uh, talk to everybody. But how we present ourselves is certainly part of our brand. If we are passionate about what it is that we're trying to teach, that's an important part. So each one of us ha is passionate about a certain area of education. And if we show them that we're passionate and that there's a value benefit to them learning this, I think it really helps. And each one of us is going to have a different style. I don't think that we should try to imitate other people's styles. I mean, I couldn't be Ed Hellenbeck if you know, the world depended on it but neither could he be me. So it's, I think it's really important But that, that the passion has to come through and we have to always constantly remind the students that this is a benefit to them, not because we're here and we just feel like teaching because we don't want to do anything else. So I, I think that's a real important distinction because it's easy to get up in front and say, I'm a professor. Therefore, I know it all, and therefore, you have to listen to me. And students are going to say, mm, tune out. And, but if you explain to them you know, why it's so important for them to know this, that it's going to help them down the road, I think that can make a big difference. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, sister, I'm sorry. No, I would, I would hope not. I think you, you have one brand, but how you um, explain it or how you work through it, that will, it, it's just like when we have brand messages at, at, for the college, we might be talking about a certain kind of, um, we have a certain message that we want to give out. I'm not going to we have a certain message that we want to get about the quality or maybe the values that we live by. How we explain those values to a student are, is probably going to be very different than how we explain those values to a prospective employer or a business that is going to employ one of our students. It still comes down to the values but it's put to get, it's given to them in a language that they accept the benefit to them. And uh, my little guy here, you know, I, this is putting my personal passion. Um, I'm very passionate, I, I use that word a lot, but I'm very passionate about protecting people that are near and dear to me and thoughts that are near and dear to me. And if you can't figure out by now, branding is pretty near and so I, I bring that passion into uh, my idea of what branding is all about. And of course, I think everybody should be branding and brand everything. I mean, that's, it's, it's a you know, non-starter. That's where we all have to be. OK, well, I want to thank you. And Ed has. Uh, before you leave, I have a.
presentation for Professor Engel, just to express oh. our appreciation from the academic committee. Thank you. And I'd like to remind you uh, to join us at the reception and also to join us next Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. to hear Father Edward Malloy. It's going to be great. It's so exciting. So please come next and tell other people because it is open to the public. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming tonight.